-hmm. But I brought something I want to show you first. Because we're at church, also, but but also because the the most important thing and the, to the Cheyenne people is our prayers and the way that we talk to God and the symbol of the symbol of our prayers and the symbol of our communication, our talking to God is our pipe. And this is a pipe that's made out of pipe stone, and you can see that it comes apart. It has a stem that's made out of wood, comes from the tree, and this, <clears throat> I think this this kind of wood right here is cottonwood. And here's another kind of pipe. You can see that that this one, these are still kind of, they're not all the way finished yet. You can see this one has spots in the wood, and um, I mean it has spots in the stone and the pipe stone. And this one is shaped a certain way. It has um, eight sides. So this is shaped like a Sundance Lodge. And that's, that's a real important ceremony to the Cheyennes. <clears throat> and this one is, you can see that the, the pipe stone is carved like an eagle. It has an eagle head on there. So <clears throat> I just wanted to, um, to bring these and and start with this because this is the most important thing to our Cheyenne people is the pipe and our prayers, our communication to God. <clears throat> so um, that's why I wanted to start with that today. So I'll lay these over there on the table and if you all want to touch them or pick them up, just be careful because they, they do come apart and if it, if it um, drops on the floor, it'll break. But you can see that this one is a little bit more shinier. It looks like it's polished. And this one is still a little, you can tell even by when I rub it, you know, it, it kind of changes color a little bit and it helps it out. So if you take this one apart, kind of rub it with your rub it with your hands. And if you want to, you can take some of the grease from your face and rub it on there. Because everybody's good thoughts and everybody's good feelings. Is what goes into this and um, so that's what we think about and um, the other little thing that I'll just talk about while I've got this out and while while um, you kids you know because this pipe it, <clears throat> we use tobacco with it they call it tobacco but really a lot of times it doesn't even have any real tobacco in it it's all different kinds of leaves and herbs and different roots that are mixed together into a smoking tobacco but a long time ago people didn't smoke just for recreation they didn't just smoke like a cigarette like people just smoke it just for fun they didn't do that smoking was a a real special thing that you only did when you said your most important prayers and even like a, like little little kids like you guys, if we if we gave you the pipe or if the pipe came to you, we would tell you just put your mouth on it and touch it, and and then after you touch it, touch yourself so you'll get that blessing from the from the natural materials, because this we believe this is a stone that God gave us to make a pipe out of and to say our prayers with, and so this stone that it has a spirit from really way deep into the earth. It even touches the center of the earth. And that's where the spirit of this stone comes from. And then you have the spirit of the plants that's represented by the wood. So when you, when you smoke a pot and, and you have the stone and you have the wood and you have the human being, all, all of it together, we believe that that's a real powerful magic. It's a real powerful thing that God gave us. He said, use it when you need help, when you need to talk to me. <clears throat> so this is just a symbol. You don't really have to have a pipe. You don't really have to have tobacco. You don't have to have anything. You can talk to God straight 
straight without anything. Anytime you want to talk to God, all you have to do is that's what you just put your mind to it and you just tell God what you want to do. Tell God. Basic things in archery is having a string. And Indians and others discovered long ago that if you took particles of, of, uh, of a tendon, broke them apart, you could twist them into strings. And what these are are little ropes. This is how ropes are made, actually. So what I do is uh, I, I break these apart, and then I'll get two pieces that are of similar size right here, like just like that right there. And to make a string, you twist one way, twist back, twist again, and so forth. And you can see it makes a twisted string right there, just like that. And that is about the size of a real bowstring. And what is now what you do is, see how short this is, you get another set and splice it in here. And you just keep going until you've got the length of string in here. And these are, it's the best tin stretching material Mother Nature makes. Now you can make a bow from just about anything that you go out and cut a branch off a tree, which I used to do when I was little because I couldn't make them like the, the, the big men do. There's how one is just starting out right there. I go out and cut logs about this big around, split them out, and then start working them down. Now here's one that's been, that's about 50%, maybe not that much, in work. You end up like this over here. Is that bow dart? Yes, it's, it's a, uh, this is a particular kind of wood that's worldwide known now. I have a website, cattlelegacy.com, and I get inquiries from all over the U.S. and all over the world now because they know about this wood. When the explorers came to America, and in particular down in our area in the southeast of uh, Mississippi, east of the, west of the Mississippi where uh, our cattle groups were, all of them mentioned that these people down there, the cattle, have this very, very good uh, bow making wood and they have the best uh, uh, bows and arrows in the world. They all mentioned that. And, and the French even gave it the name Bodark, Wood of Archery. And so people around the world know about this. I, did a, I, I made a bow for someone in Italy, and he said, okay, good, I'm going to replicate that. I said, all right, you know, I'll help you. And he said, you know, we, we know how to make bows. And I said, well, what kind of wood are you going to use? And I, he said, we're going to use Bodark, which grows in this area here. Uh, modern, when the Europeans came, they brought this very wonderful tool. It's called a draw knife. And it's something that if, if you're in, you, that you almost have to have for, um, somebody put your foot on there, right there. Just just get a little stop, yeah. Just so it don't take off. Yeah, just put your foot on it real hard. Okay, there, I, I, okay, there you go. And, and this is how it works. And you can, with it real sharp, you can, you can shave this wood in a controlled way because you have to be real accurate on the back side of the bow. I'm going to turn it over here. And also, of course, it takes out. See how uh, nice and yellow that wood is? It doesn't stay that way very long, but it starts out like that. So, from the log, I end up with this, and then I will write, uh, draw a profile on it, and using a hatchet and uh, uh, and a rasp, uh, trim it down to that, and then thin out the backside. And pretty soon, I start bending it like this until I see it bending right. <coughs> Put a string on it and ready to shoot. I can do one in about three days, if you're, and that's long, hard work, eight hours. And so that's, that's how they're made. Uh, my arrows, natural. Um, I start with a dogwood uh, shaft like this, sapling. Dogwood is the these kind of flower in the spring. You see them all over. There's like 20 varieties in the U.S., but they all have the, they're real hard make excellent arrows. I keep scraping them with a knife until 
I get something, get it down to this size. Here is a flint point that would come have come from making flakes off this that are put into a notch here. And then it is wrapped tightly with sinew. <coughs> Wrap real tight and sinew, you put it in your uh, you, you have it in your mouth and the saliva mixes with it and, it and it makes its own glue pretty much. So it'll wrap real good, real tightly, real nice, a half hitch and boy it's on there forever. For the uh, feathers, wild turkey, wind feathers, called pointers, I peel them off like this and this is the way virtually every arrow maker does. Like that and clip up, clip up something like this and then I will tie them and glue them onto the back end, three of them. And that makes my arrow. All this kind of a bow. It's just a slat, see. And uh, they start looking at it and they said, man, those, uh, these natives here, can, you know, they really got something going there because they could see how well they worked and that they didn't uh, that they didn't break and in fact later on it was given the name American Indian Flatbow. If you go on Google and, and Google American Indian Flatbow you'll come up with a lot of articles about it. It's a special place in, in, in modern in, in, in archery back into the early colonial times and because it's thin like this the stresses stay low on it. Now when um, uh, uh, Robin Hood's bows tended to be about almost eight feet long and they made them round which is the worst design scientifically. I'm a mechanical engineer and structural engineer and I know what, what makes makes a good design and a bad design after I grew up and went to school to learn about it and when they're thin like this and they bend the stresses stay down. When they're real thick those stresses build up and, and Robin Hood's bows had to be that long where they'd break. And they did it break eventually. They'd start breaking on the inside, crushing, and it wouldn't last that long. So uh, American Indians ended up with a special place in archery with, I mean in many other places too, obviously, but uh, with the American Indian flat bow, and here's a good example of one right here. Notice how dark it is. It starts out like this, but this wood over time will become this. I've had this for 50 years, I guess. Maybe not, well, yeah, about that long, I guess. Uh, and that's something I like about it. It just has this nice, warm, nice, warm, brown, almost chocolate colored. Here, touch that. You'll be a better little girl for it. Pass it around. Is that a buckskin string, bowstring? I, I don't have a buckskin string. Uh, Okay, Is that one sinew? Now here's a boy I hunt with right now. It's about 50. I just hunt with a real strong bow, like 60 pounds, but I can't pull it anymore. I thought you were really strong. Well, I, I, I <laughs> what did I say earlier? <laughs> I, I can't hardly run anymore either. <laughs> I couldn't beat the little girl. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, just, uh, Is there a seat? <laughs> this is a replica of a bow that was found in a cattle chieftain's tomb in uh, near Louisiana. Uh, it was dated 10, that bow was dated about 10 AD. And uh, simple. It's, it's not quite as wide as the American Indian flat bow, but I made a few of them and I was surprised to see how very, very strong they are. They're, this one's about 60 pounds. If you pull them, don't dry fire them, just you know, pull them and, and tug on them and, uh, and, and back down. Well, let me see here. Here's one I made for my sister that is of a cattle Indian style, shorter, and this is, is the, the basis for it is found on, on drawings or on engravings on shells that were found in, in uh, different mounds here and there. 
And uh, as I recall, I did shoot this in the, in the shoots. Shoots very well. I made this for a fellow. He gave me all these instructions, on and on and on. I finally got it to him, and he said, "Well, I decided not to take it." So I almost hit him over the head with it. Yeah. It's, it's extra long. I don't usually make them this long. Here's the making belt right here, and uh, it's about a sixty-pound for a woman's buckskin dress. The same here. This is designed for a man's moccasin. And these are men's designs here. And um, you know, they would tell you to, to make things that would remind you of something really good, something that's good to think about. So this one right here is a teepee design or a mountain design. So that reminds you of your home. And this one is a deer. You can see the little deer design. And something about Indian designs they always have a little piece in there that symbolizes their heart. So that's what this little triangle inside his, his chest that symbolizes his heart. And this design here comes from the design of migrating geese or migrating ducks. You know how you look up in the sky and you see the design of migrating, migrating birds? And that's what this design is. And that reminds you that you always have to stay ready. That Things in life come along and you have to be ready, you have to be prepared. And a long time ago they, they would have to move from place to place. So it was a reminder to have all your stuff ready and have all your stuff packed. Know where your stuff is because you might have to move at a moment's notice. You might have to move really quick. And Justine brought some porcupine quills. So you can see what these quills look like. Well, what another advantage of porcupine or the beans over the porcupine quills? Don't you have to put the porcupine quills in your mouth? Yeah, you have to put these in your mouth so they'll get soft, so the and they won't break. Eventually, they would go blind because if you if you flatten porcupine quills over the years for a number of years, there's a substance in them, but mm. eventually you'll really lose your sight. So, ladies that did that consciously made that decision. They knew they would eventually sacrifice their eyesight. There's a there's an old Blackfoot lady I knew up north that was like that, that was blind from the so cool one. So the same way with um, with ladies' moccasins, you can see that, that this is a ladies' style. And it has a little patch right here in the front. And this is a man's style. It has the two rows that are separated. So it's just a little... A uh, little bit of difference. This sometimes people call this a teepee door. That little patch on the inside, and this design came from mm -hmm. from a teepee door also. But um, this one, it, it doesn't have the um, it doesn't have the doorway marked into it. So this is just called a star or Ikhilodokioha in Cheyenne. It's called a star. And another important design that we have is a thunderbird, and that's a just a mythical bird because we believe that all things have a spirit, and so they they thought of the spirit of the thunder as as a bird, and they called it a thunderbird. So you see it different ways, and usually it, the wings of the thunderbird have little shapes that signify clouds. And sometimes it has lightning or something in there. Well, buffaloes, they, they provided everything. They provided the house, they provided the food, they provided the tools. So buffalo was a really important thing. And uh, you can see how big this one is. And a regular teepee would take 26, 26 of these buffaloes. So if you if you would, would just imagine having 26 buffalo hides like this stretched out in this building, it would almost cover this whole floor. So you can imagine how big of a teepee that would make.